Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Textbooks to Extended Reality, How Medical Education is Transforming the Next Generation. Uh, my name is Elise Hetu, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations for the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. First, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, and we respect the histories languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. The Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry is proud to be participating in this year's virtual Alumni Week. I would like to extend a warm welcome to the alumni audience members and wish you all a happy Alumni Week. Thank you for your continued support and interest in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. I would also like to welcome all other members of our extended community. Our audience members tonight come from diverse range of backgrounds and affiliations with the faculty. We are pleased to have you and we appreciate your time and interest in the topic. This session will include a 15 minute presentation on extended reality by Dr. Lynn Sodenberg, followed by a 40 minute panel discussion led by Dr. Jonathan Duff with panelists Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg. Paula Point and Victor Dew. Audience questions will be taken throughout the session, so please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. The final 30 minutes of the webinar will be dedicated to a special bonus demonstration of virtual and augmented reality led by Drs. Lynn Sonnenberg and Paul LaPointe. And we have a special guest who will be joining to help in with the demo, Dr. Brittany uh, Lucina. She received a BSc in Honours Neuroscience in 2016 and a medical degree in 2020 from the University of Alberta. She was involved in developing a learning module using an online virtual anatomy tool during her time as a medical student. We really appreciate you joining us, Dr. Lucina. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the event for those who missed it live. I would now like to welcome Dr. Brenda Hemmelgarn, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, to provide introductory remarks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special presentation. It's great to be here with you for my first U of A Alumni Week. It's been a pleasure getting to know you since I began as Dean in January. I'd like to take this moment to thank you for your participation in initiatives like the Alumni Advisory Council and our strategic planning engagement sessions. I'm grateful to you for sharing the depth of your experience and your input's key to building our future. Because of the pandemic, we've had to approach this year's alumni gathering in a very different way, but I'm confident that even though we can't meet in person, you'll find we've planned an exciting, engaging schedule for you. Medical education is vibrant and constantly changing, adapting to meet the needs of the communities we serve and of the learners in our classes. I know that as proud alumni, you are curious about how things may have changed since you were a student here. Our Innovative Academic Technologies Office, led by Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, is a point of pride for the faculty. The creativity and scientific curiosity among this interdisciplinary and highly collaborative group continue to amaze me. Tonight, we're fortunate to hear from some of the shining lights in this group, including Dr. Paul Lapointe, Director of Extended Reality, and Dr. Jonathan Duff, Director of Simulation, and the moderator for this evening's panel. I'm also proud to introduce you to Dr. Victor Du a 2020 graduate of the MD program and one of the newest members of our alumni family. Dr. Dew is a passionate advocate for innovation in medical education. And as a recent graduate, he brings valuable insights to this evening's panel. I also appreciate Dr. Brittany Lasana for joining us to help with the bonus demonstration at the end. Before we begin, I want to thank you all for your continued commitment to new alumni and current students. Well, technological advancements like you'll see this evening are immensely important to education. Nothing takes the place of the kinds of mentorship and support you so generously give. 
And if you haven't worked closely with learners in the past and would like to get involved now, we'd love to have you. Please get in touch and we'll be happy to connect you with our various mentorship and career development programs. Now, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg, who will start us off with a presentation. Over to you, Lynn. So how old were you when you first experienced virtual reality? Now, I know many of you are thinking, Lynn, I've never experienced virtual reality, but just wait. Have you? How many of this look familiar to you? Yes, it is the 3D virtual finder, view master, which uses stereoscopic images to create a 3D image. I know this was definitely part of my childhood. Or perhaps you have seen a photograph. This photograph also creates a sense of awe and wonder and transports you to another place. If we look at this Milgram continuum conceived in the late 80s, early 90s by Paul Milgram, a professor of engineering at the University of Toronto, he refers to this as the virtual continuum, where we have what reality is on the right-hand side and what reality can be in a virtual environment, 360 degrees, completely immersed. I like to think of augmented reality as a way to enhance what is, falling closer to the reality aspect, and virtual reality is a way to represent what could be. Now, even after those initial definitions, I was still rather confused. And so I bring myself back to the hollow deck demonstrated here by Commander Riker clearly, clearly on the USS Enterprise versus here looking at augmented reality with the hologram being displayed by R2-D2 um, with Princess Leia. Help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope from episode number Yes, episode four. And so while you're saying these pieces, you're probably thinking, but has any of this really truly grounded in strong educational theory? And as an educator myself, I couldn't do a presentation without mentioning my three of my favorites, Dewey, Vygotsky, and Piaget, all draw from this educational theory of constructivism where knowledge is literally constructed through an individual's interaction with the environment. We take inputs from the senses, we take our existing knowledge and new information to develop new meaning and understanding. In essence, it sounds like what we do every day in medicine. It also sounds like what we do when we look at different forms of reality, anywhere from current all the way into virtual reality. And the research has demonstrated over time that at every level of education, virtual reality has this potential to make a difference, lead to new discoveries, motivate, encourage, and excite. But you're adding all these additional things to the medical curriculum. And let's face it, the human body hasn't changed that much over time, but yet the wealth of information we know about the, the human body has just skyrocketed log log, I can't remember what that, logimentary, anyway, I think logarithmically, there it is, over time. And so time and time and time again is what we're actually missing. But good thing we have studied and found out that a 60-minute traditional lecture can actually be distilled down into 20 minutes in virtual reality with the same learning retention outcomes saving us extra time while having a little bit of fun, which never hurt learning. One of the greatest learner needs and challenges when we talk to our current students and our learners is picturing the body in three dimensions, three dimension learning, and not just the body, but right down to its molecular structures and how to take something or see it 
presented more traditionally on paper and yet have to work with it, um, be challenged with it, see it in front of you in three dimensions. It's not very often that a patient will actually appear to us in a flat 2D object, unless of course it's flat Stanley, a children's book reference. Sorry, I had to fit that in as a pediatrician. And so many of us might remember this Molecular Vision's flexible molecular model kit. So earlier when we were talking, both Dr. LaPointe, Dr. Ju, and myself had this very kit. And I'm sure hopefully many of you will, will, will be familiar with this as well. It actually allowed you to put the bonds together very carefully and construct these organic chemistry or inorganic models. And so it really sort of helped in, in a somewhat of an augmented reality sort of picture. We also recognize the DNA structures. So here would be a classical slide taken out of Dr. Paul LaPointe's presentation. What we recognize though is how augmented reality builds upon this flat piece of paper. And so in Dr. LaPointe's lectures, the videos actually come alive. And so we're now able to take this image wherever it happens to be and be able to now see it in three dimensions. Which of course is not appearing on my slide. So give me one quick second. As everyone sits in silence. Perfect. So literally by taking a freely available app, we're able to have this piece of paper come alive before us. And this three dimensional helical structure is now forming literally in front of us. And as this video sort of camera moves, you can see this object is actually suspended in front of you, the learner in front of the screen, demonstrating both the five prime and three prime end of this structure. And then coming to life even further are the adenine and thymine and the guanine and the cytosine. And if you look even really close into this model, you can start to see the little hydrogen bonds that are forming between them. And whether they're two bonds or whether they're three bonds, all of this coming to life in front of our very eyes. And that's a little teaser as what Dr. Paul LaPointe is going to be showing us later in the demo. We also recognize that a lot of learner needs surrounded actually understanding and learning about clinical anatomy. And so it's been a, probably a timeless struggle for trying to comprehend all of the, the deep ana anatomy before us. And so we've implemented anatomy.tv, not really TV per se, but almost perhaps even more fun than watching TV, where we have the dissection model on the one side and compared beside it, a 3D model creation on the right. And as we look, we can hover to discover what the actual, the an anatomical marking is below us. And by clicking on that, we see it both in the dissection model and we see it in the 3D model and it will give us that label. And Dr. Lissina is gonna be demonstrating that further. Our students want to be able to learn from home. They want to be able to take that dissection lab, which is so valuable, and continue to learn from it in the home environment. And this very sort of integration of this anatomy structure allows them to do just that. And so it also gives them active dissection within that three-dimensional approach. So a triple win. We've gone one step further and recognized that caring for post-surgical patients can be challenging, particularly those with congenital heart malformations requiring surgery. And working with Dr. Charles Larson, we've taken actual patient images and printed in three dimensions their hearts. These hearts sit on the bedside beside the child. They help with pre-surgical planning, they help in post-surgical management and is an opportunity and a shared mental model and understanding of what the actual challenges are in terms of the malformation, the repair, and then the subsequent implications on that on the physiology and the anatomy. 
it's so much easier now to have the complexity visualized and actually holding that heart as a model to help make that understanding. We've seen a huge shift in care, understanding um, between the entire team, not just the patient and the physician, but the respiratory therapist, the um, uh, students, the learners, um, and the nursing staff have really come together um, around some of these learning um, innovations that have been put in to help not just the learner, but everyone. Because we truly believe that if we transform the learner, we transform care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sonnenberg. That was amazing. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so the, uh, my name is Jonathan Duff. I'm a Pete's ICU physician here at the University of Alberta. I graduated in the class of 2000, so it was a little bit while ago. Uh, and I have the privilege of moderating uh, our panel discussion tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a bit of a rich discussion around how medical education has changed and how it's evolved over the, over the decades and how technology has flavored that. Uh, we've had some questions already submitted uh, from people in the audience, so we're going to do our best to get to those questions. If we can't get to some of the pre-submitted questions, bear with us. We'll do our best to either address them in the Q&A or we'll get to them uh, over email after the presentation. Um, we're keeping an eye on the Q&A as well, so if there's questions that come up that you want to throw to the panelists, by all means, uh, type them into your Q&A box and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So, why don't we start right kind of from the beginning? I mean, I think if we look at medical education and where it's come from, how have things have changed? Um, as you guys know, much of, of medical education and how it was framed came from the 1900s when Flexner sat down and tried to streamline and consolidate medical education through North America and through Europe. And if he were to tr be transported into the future, you know, 110 years later and looked at how we teach people, you'd see some things that were pretty similar. You know, we do two years of pre-clerkship, we do two years of clerkship. The, uh, I mean, he'd be clearly overwhelmed by the other things that we do, you know, antibiotics and, you know, ECMO and all these wonderful things. But the framework of medical education hasn't really changed that much. Um, so maybe we'll start there. So Lynn, you get to be here on the panel with me. And I think both of us graduated medical school from, it was a little while ago, me obviously much longer than you. Um, but how, how have you seen things change? Well, the biggest one is there was no Google back when I was in medical school. So uh, now I know I Google pretty much anything I don't understand. Uh, textbooks were just coming online 20 years ago. And so that virtual sort of searchable library was just in its infancy. And I think if we look over time, we've seen a huge movement to information being freely available, not just to physicians, but now a shared understanding with patients having very similar access to, to resources. And that can be uh, both um, a huge blessing and can also create a, a few additional complications and challenges in working through what is fake news and information and balancing it with um, truth and sort of context. And I think within medical education, the environment has changed. So recognizing that working in the hospital at 120 hours a week, which is where it was for me, is, is not a sustainable model. Um, it's not healthy. It's, it's not setting up our, our learners or our profession for success. And so looking at how we continue to promote um, healthy environments for both our learners um, and our staff. Those are some things that kind of come to mind for me. Yeah, as, and as you were talking about it, that, that was one of the things I thought of as well is I remember my first day on the wards and I was at the ALEC doing internal medicine. I had my, my white coat on and about 75 pounds worth of handbooks and little books and notepads and things to remember all the, all the little things I needed to remember as a medical student. And now I have a phone that I can Google and I can go to Wikipedia and there's this huge amount of information that's just available for me just all the time. 
My, the, my uh, podcast was, was a tape recorder. Like I would get from the library an actual cassette tape and put it in for my commute back and forth, an, an actual cassette tape. And, and now they're, they're available just at the push of a button. Some amazing resources just out of the University of Alberta with uh, Surgery 101 and PEDS cases, top international downloads um, internationally. It's amazing coming right here from the University of Alberta. Sorry, I had to put oh, that. I think it just speaks that pediatrics is awesome, but I'm slightly biased. The, uh, so Paul, you've been, you've been teaching uh, undergrad, graduate, teaching some of the medical students. What changes do you see as an instructor? Um, I think like, like uh, you and Lynn, I think I, I, I'd like, it's most useful to compare it to how it was when I was an undergraduate. I graduated from genetics in 1997, and, and um, there were certainly a lot to know and at, even at that time, the amount of information that was being generated in research labs, you know, all over the world, it was, it was happening, but it's, it sounds like a cliche to say this information is moving at such a rapid pace that the practical limitations on bringing students coming out of high school to the frontier of knowledge in their field is becoming, you know, an impossible task because there is so much information. I like to tell my students that the Human Genome Project took the entirety of my PhD studies and, and more and cost a billion dollars. And now they can have their whole exome sequence for $100 and browse the Neanderthal genome on their phone. So there's so much to know. And the unfortunate reality is a lot of people um, take advantage of exactly what Lynn said, that information is free. The information that used to be housed and kept in a place like a university is free. And what we what I've tried to do in my class is to be, to, to put the focus on making sense of that information so they understand it. And I, and I, it, it's more efficient, as Lynn pointed out, you can teach them more and provide them with a meaningful understanding of what they're learning. And, and I like to tell my students who are kind of ingrained to remember and memorize facts that they don't need to remember the things they understand. And so that's what this technology has really allowed me to accomplish for my students. Yeah, I would second that too. I mean, there's a, there's more of a focus, there's less of a focus on memorizing things that you can look up very, very quickly, but it's understanding how to get to that information, how to curate that information, how to apply that information, getting more into problem solving, higher levels of, levels of cognition, and not just rote memorization of the brachial plexus and those kinds of things. When we were looking at the anatomy stuff, I was starting to have PTSD about anatomy 101. The, uh, so Victor, you just you just finished medical school. You're starting your PEDS residency again, pediatrics, um, and just served as the president of the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. So you're just fresh through this. What it's been like for students recently? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the things that uh, Dr. Sonnenberg and Dr. Lapointe have mentioned with regards to the sheer amount of information certainly is felt by students and trying to keep up and access the information. Uh, in a way that you can retain it uh, and apply it is uh, a struggle that we have. Um, and so really that change to all these tools and technologies that we're seeing, I think is really helping um, with that. We've also shifted a lot away from, you know, that chalkboard and big classroom lecture to a lot more small group uh, application type uh, opportunities, which I think also um, is the way a lot of education is going. and. Um, seems to, for us, have been able to push us to start thinking of how you apply to the clinical setting early on. And then one of the most fundamental shifts I think I've seen even in my four years of medical school uh, is how medicine is starting to see their role in much more than just, um, you know, physiology and prescribing drugs, but looking at social accountability, uh, our role in uh, equity, diversity, inclusivity in medicine and society, um, the leadership that we can play in ensuring that we uh, create health promoting teams and what Dr. Sonnenberg was talking about with respect to uh, well-being for clinicians and for those working in the field. Um, and I think that might be the biggest um, innovation which doesn't necessarily push technology or anything, although um, I think that the advent of electronic medical records and all these things that have uh, in some ways been such a, a blessing and in other ways uh, problematic have made us think a bit more of that. Um, it might be the biggest innovation thing that uh, we've seen and, and is something that we'll probably be embracing for the years to come. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, 
technology has allowed us to do some fantastic things to improve our efficiencies. And perhaps that gives us time to focus on things that medicine may not have really focused on in the past. And I think you've highlighted some nice ones there. Um, so elephant in the room. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a, there's a pandemic. Uh, normally we'd be doing this in a nice cozy auditorium. Uh, there'd be cheese, there might be wine. You know, we could all sit and chat about these things. And now we're doing it over Zoom. Uh, I don't know about uh, the other people in the panel here, but uh, I spent seven and a half hours on Zoom yesterday. I'm um, actually starting to get sores in my ears from having headphones in so much. Uh, so it's, it's really changed how we've had to do things and how we've had to adapt and technology has been a big part of that. So Lynn, I know your group's been very much involved in trying to uh, spearhead the faculty's approach to education in the pandemic and in the era of social distancing. So walk us through that a little bit. What's, what do you see is happening there? I think the University of Alberta has really, we were ahead of the curve, which is really nice to be able to say we had 97% of our uh, medical school lectures vodcasted. So that meant they were lecture captured for review at a later time, meaning you didn't have to actually be in the classroom in order to get that, that teaching, that interaction. And so when we needed to move from an in-person class environment into a distance learning, the majority of our programs were already poised and ready to do that. The materials were available online. And I think that really has to address the mindset of our faculty in always being ready. So sort of being able to predict where we're going and getting there just ahead of the curve made our transition to this delivery a lot more seamless. One of the challenges of course is being now, how do we facilitate a learner into a virtual clinic, clinical encounter, noting that it's new for patients, it's new for clinicians, and then the complexity of adding a learner and having that be a rich experience has, has been a challenge. And so thankfully, we've been able to use breakout rooms through available through um, secured Zoom um, lines and working with Alberta Health Services and recognizing that we can do a lot more with these in virtual sort of encounters than we thought possible. And so I have, being a pediatrician once again, you know, dolls and little things that I use to help demonstrate, you know, physical exam skills that I need and positioning. And, and I'm able to observe the learner a lot more readily. So, you know, I can drop off of the screen and it just be the focus on the learner where I'm still very present in the background watching, but no longer is the patient directing everything towards me because I'm the more senior clinician in the room. And I can also give real time feedback right after to the learners as well. I'm a little less distracted. I don't have to worry about travel um, other than going from here to the kitchen and maybe back again from time to time. So one of the questions that did come in ahead of time was, are we adequately able to assess patients? And I would say we can do a lot more than we thought we could. And for when that's not available, we do have that availability still to bring in those patients to be able to assess them in person. And so we're able to balance both what we can do virtually and what we need to do in person. And plus we're saving the environment, the time, the parking, all of those sort of pieces. There's, there's a lot of convenience that comes with just being able to click into an appointment as opposed to waiting for hours with travel, et cetera. And I think that's a benefit for learners too. They can literally finish in one place and be in another across the city um, with just the click of a button now. Oh, well, I think, I think it's a good point. It's uh... And it's, I agree with you, it's the, it's that whole part of innovation is not necessarily responding to a change, it's knowing what change to respond to and getting in the direction that you need to go. And I think I would, I'm slightly biased, but I think I would agree. I think we've done an amazing job of trying to keep that up, but there are challenges, uh, certainly challenges. Um, Victor, you're, you've just gone through all of this. What's it been like being a medical student and now a resident through the time of COVID? Yeah, it's certainly uh, been a challenge and a lot of interesting things you never would have thought uh, starting medical school that we'd be finishing medical school in my class and starting residency uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, you know, so at the initial height of things in March, um, nationally, all students who were in clinical, so our clerkship years, uh, were kind of pulled from our clinical rotations 
for the purposes of ensuring that um, safety was paramount, that we uh, conserved PPE uh, and kind of made sure that uh, the learning environment was uh, appropriate for students. And um, we worked over the coming months to do some online learning, which uh, the U of A uh, was a leader in, especially in pediatrics again, where they had a, a great pediatric boot camp that was um, featured. Um, and then working slowly again for those in clinical uh, learning years to come back in July to a very different reality. Uh, you know, across Canada um, now, as you prepare to start clerkship, uh, there are new modules with regards to how to properly um, dot and doff at levels that are different than, than when I started. Um, virtual learning, um, virtual clinics, like Dr. Sonnenberg was talking about, is now uh, mainstay in your kind of orientation to the clinical environment, which wasn't the case before. And I did my first virtual clinic really um, in residency at the same time as my preceptor did their first virtual clinic. So one of the interesting things here is that we really are learning together and making mistakes together and trying to navigate that all together because um, while the clinician um, or my preceptor has more clinical experience um, at times, I may have more technological experience. And so us working through that has been interesting. Um, and then for those who are in pre clerkship so uh, learning mostly in the classroom or small group things, again, that's all been moved online. And uh, nationally, people have done quite well, uh, including the U of A, of trying to move that over, uh, moving assessments and exams, um, where you know usually you come in, sit in a computer lab, now people are doing it at home. Um, through different secure methods and, and things like that. So a lot of disruption um, from that standpoint. And I think that one of the bigger things to point out is um, the sense of community and isolation that has been difficult for students. A lot of us, we go through a lot in our training um, and we rely on our teams and our friends and um, classmates to help get us through. And doing it kind of more remotely um, in pre clerkship or even in the clinical environment has been difficult. So just as with everyone else who's been trying to adapt um, and look at ways to connect, uh, the same has been said for uh, medical learners if we try to navigate this as well. Yeah, thanks, Victor. And I, you, you used an interesting word there, the idea of disruption. And I think that captures everything that's happened in our lives over the last six months. It's, it's sort of one disruption after another. Um, the reason I, I click to it is this whole idea that that's what drives innovation, that's what drives new ideas, is you disrupt the status quo and then you're forced to do something different. The, uh, Paul, what's it been like for you as an instructor in all of this? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly been very difficult. I mean, I teach uh, a class with 160 students in it. Um, and so I, you know, despite the class size, when I'm in an in-person setting, I, I usually get pretty good at recognizing faces and, you know, uh, recognizing what the educational needs are of different people in the class and, and, and those types of things. But moving everything online has been um, extremely difficult. Um, my, so my, my relationship with the students with respect to how I can better um, uh, you know, serve their needs. And I mean, it's a, it's, it's kind of related to something Victor said earlier about, uh, you know, inclusion. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot about just the huge number of ways students understand things. And, you know, I'm kind of pride myself on being able to explain things in different ways, but you need to know you need to do it um, for individual students. And that's been very challenging to, to identify what the students need in this sort of Zoom, Zoom based instruction. And so, um, we've had to, uh, you know, what I really appreciate is the leadership coming from the students themselves. They've organized virtual groups, um, you know, Discord channels, uh, you know, Slack channels, um, you know, the, which, which they've included me on some and, and uh, you know, but I, for, for the most part, I, 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 I'm kind of, you know, glad they're handling some of these things on their own, but uh, uh, it's, it's hard because even in a large class like that, there's a sense of community that is kind of missing, so. Yeah, I think there's there's been a lot of been a lot of change, but I I think one of the things that I see is a lot of the technologies and a lot of the techniques that we were starting to push forward uh, even before COVID hit, we've been able to take advantage of. Like for example, in talking about uh, broadcasting and recording medi uh, the medical student lectures so that uh, the students can get to them, can review them, can go over them again without necessarily even having been there in the first place. Um, 
I see one of the big things I see is also a focus when we're looking at medical education, uh, more and more of a focus on patient safety and on how we balance, you know, our learners getting in to do things and to learn things, but still keeping an eye on our patients and keeping them first and keeping them the priority. Uh, I think certainly for me, when I was in medical school, the, the phrase that was often used is, you know, see one, do one, teach one. And that was sort of what it was like when I was on the wards as a medical student. Um, the, uh, even Flexner in 1910 wanted students to learn by doing, which I think is great. But now in this era of simulation and virtual and augmented reality, we have ways of allowing our students to do these things without actually doing them on my mother, for instance. So maybe the first see one, do one, teach one we do can be on a, on a mannequin or in a virtual environment. The, uh, Victor, how has that, how has that worked for you? I mean, using technology to get some experiences before you're actually seeing patients doing things on real patients. Yeah, I think the use of simulation and these new tools uh, have been really critical. Um, it's really hard to go from the old method of just seeing it on a book and then jumping to the do, even when you see in between. Uh, but having this almost intermediary of uh, something that's more realistic, uh, a simulation or whatnot, um, really helps you be able to you know, explore and almost make mistakes in a safe environment, knowing that um, you know, this is you know, not the, the real thing per se. Um, and then I think we've done so, so well at being able to replicate in very similar fashions what you would see uh, in the actual patient uh, in the simulations and things that we do. And so I notice a kind of question coming up around, um, can we train people in the right way uh, or, or as well um, in the chat? And one of the things um, I know students have talked about is often uh, when we're in our preclinical, before we go into the hospital environments learning, we learn physical exam skills and we either do them with each other or we do them with um, standardized patients who come uh, and, and allow us to do exam on them. Obviously with, with COVID and the things we've had to make modifications to that, uh, we're not having in-person sessions like that if they're you know, not necessary in order to limit uh, infection and things like that. And so being able to change that and look at how can you deliver things like that, which used to be done in person and are critical to a virtual method, I think um, we're actually now able to do. And it's about adopting it in the right way and integrating it into the curriculum well. Um, but I, I do see us moving further and further into that and um, that our experiences as we saw in the demonstrations in Dr. Sonnenberg's presentation can be very realistic uh, and excellent learning opportunities. Thanks, Victor. I, I, I agree. I think one of the things uh, that you talked about there was uh, that we've had to be very thoughtful about how we integrate these technologies. Um, COVID has highlighted that, but I think even before the pandemic had happened, we were already being forced to be thoughtful about where is the best place to use this. The pandemic, I think, just heightened that. Do you see the same thing, Lynn? Absolutely. It, it's taken us back to almost the basics again. Like, what is the what is the importance? How do we learn? How should we learn? Sometimes when we're just in the routine of things, you you don't actually get a moment to stop and reevaluate. And so for us, it's always been what is the, the pedagogy or what is the learning principle behind why we're doing what we're doing? And sometimes we realize we we miss the boat, like with three dimensional learning and needing to go back to to recognizing how students learn those complex um, problems and situations. Sometimes the best learning is through a lecture. Sometimes it's, it's through reading. Sometimes it's in group discussion. But not everything lends itself well to technology or to group discussion. Sometimes you just need to sit down with the coloring pencils in the anatomy physiology book and, and color in those structures to learn them. One of the other questions is around, you know, virtual reality and how we've been able to distill down large amounts of lecture and put them in a, in a smaller amount of time. And I think, you know, from the video that I demonstrated with, with Paul, you know, that provided is, is part of my PhD study was in molecular biology. And yet 
to see that come alive and see how that twisted on each other and see, I didn't even know there were hydrogen bonds and differences between them. And suddenly all of the things that I had read over and over again, and I had to read them over and over again because they were boring and I fell asleep, suddenly came alive in that moment. And I now have such a stronger visual appreciation for what that is, being a visual learner. And so that that's with me. I've now learned the concept. I didn't just have to memorize the facts. And that's how technology and where we're moving today has been such a powerful tool. And one of the other pre-submitted questions was medical students and can they get involved with this research? Absolutely. Can they get involved with looking at what are we doing? Are we doing the right things? And, and is this helping? Are we moving in the right direction? Or do we need to go back again and reevaluate our methods? And this time during the pandemic has afforded us those opportunities. Paul, did you have a comment about the uh, the questions in the box about time and how VR can speed things up? Oh yeah, I mean, I just I I if 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 you think about the amount of time it would take to describe to someone with bullet points or pictures, static images, the difference between how a, a wood screw works and how a nail works, it would take you an awful long time and a lot of different kind of factoids to describe to a person who had never seen them before the difference between a screw and a nail. But if you hand someone a screwdriver or a power drill and a hammer, they, they will learn that in a matter of, in less than a minute, and they'll never forget it. And I think that this immersive, you know, sort of fantastic voyage that you can take a student on, they learn things, it becomes more intuitive as opposed to trying to piece together a picture of what something is from, from these kind of factoids. So that's just kind of something that I think is important. I think it's also moved us into that opportunity to look at simulation again and recognizing that the first time we need to intubate or the first time we need to work through complexity should not be on my mother or grandmother. It, it should be on a mannequin. It should be in that safe environment where we can do it again and again and again. And so looking at the role of simulation and how it needs to be better integrated is definitely a goal of where our faculty is headed over these next five years. And I guess I don't need to tell that to, to you, John, as, as leading sort of that, that project and that initiative forward. I, I'm only slightly biased, uh, but I would have to completely agree. Uh, I think, I think you're, you're quite right, Lynn. I think simulation and simulation-based education techniques uh, will take us, I think, into the future of how we teach our students, our learners, and how we maintain our own skills as, as clinicians. Um, and I, it's one of these things where, just as you've described, we can provide safe environments for learners to practice and practice and practice and practice until they can do it the way it needs to be done. We, we talk about practice makes perfect, but that's probably not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. And the more time that you can spend on task, getting feedback and then doing it again, getting feedback and doing it again, that's how we learn. If you think about anybody who's a very high skilled anything, um, football player, tennis player, chess player, what have you, musician, how do they do um, that we can practice and practice and practice. It also gives our students context so that I remember the first time I saw a patient with chest pain and all I knew about chest pain was what I had learned in lectures. And I, just as Paul has kind of described, I knew bullet points and I knew differentials and I knew this and I knew that. But to see a patient in front of me live with chest pain kind of blew my mind a little bit because now I had to apply that. And now our students get that when they go from second year to third year, they spend some time in the simulation lab and the first patient that they see with chest pain is plastic. And she introduces herself and she says, I have horrible chest pain. Can you help me doctor? And they have to work through a differential and figure out, okay, what are we going to do next for this situation that could be quite high stakes and quite dangerous, but they can practice. And if something doesn't go quite right, well, that's okay. I can reboot the mannequin and we can start again and just keep doing it and doing it until people are comfortable. Um, what's an example of a, just a question in the Q&A, an example of a procedure that we can do in simulation that we used to have to do in real life. Um, I think there are, the, the sky is sort of the limit. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example in surgery. Uh, the, one of the more common surgical procedures done right now, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, so removing gallbladders laparoscopically. Uh, the first time you used to do that as a, as a resident would be on a real patient. 
uh, you'd hold the camera, you'd make the attending surgeon seasick with, because you wouldn't hold the camera properly and everything would be moving around and you're kind of trying to get in there and figure out how to do this. Yep, me too. Now we have, we have task trainers that have visual feedback, haptic feedback, so the tissue feels tough. They start off not by even doing that, they start off uh, at the ALEC in the cases suite by practicing with the laparoscopic tools and tying knots and moving blocks and getting the, the, the hand-tie coordination that you need to do laparoscopic surgery. Then they move to a task trainer and now it looks like a real surgery. And there's a, there's a gallbladder and there's an artery and if they don't clip things quite right, there's bleeding and they have to deal with all of those things. And we, they work their way through that. So then when they get into the operating room and now they're doing it on a real patient, is it exactly the same as the sim? Of course not. We can't duplicate real life perfectly. But now the surgeons, when they're teaching that resident, they're not spending their time teaching the basics of laparoscopic surgery. They're finessing, they're manipular, they're trying to upgrade little things, change little things, and that saves time. Uh, one of the questions that we got uh, pre-submitted is, is there evidence about these things, about technologies, including things like simulation, improving outcomes? Definitely. Uh, there are now hundreds and hundreds of studies looking at simulation as an example, improving educational outcomes, and more and more studies looking at simulation and other of these types of te uh, techniques to teach, improving patient outcomes. So not just, oh, they learned it better, but they retained it and they were able to transfer it into the patient environment, which is exactly what we wanted to. Um, the other great piece is how we've been partnering with other faculties as well. So we have partnered with agriculture actually to grow um, some of the plant-based materials that represent vessels. They've, they've been doing that work with us. We've been partnering with the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine and the work they've been doing in virtual reality. And so dental students used to practice their first injections on each other. And now they do it in a virtual reality environment with the haptic, so you can actually feel the injection. You have to have all the alignment correctly and the patient will die if you inject the wrong way or you'll get, you know, real time feedback on you were in the right spot, you were not in the right spot. And I'm sure many dental students are very thankful for that virtual environment uh, as to where that, you know, maybe one of their colleagues or classmates can practice in the virtual world before actually practicing on them. I, as a, for, as a former, yeah, as a formal dental phobic, I am super happy that they're not practicing on each other. The, uh, so Victor, I mean, you have a bit of a national perspective of all of this because of your role with the Federation of Medical Students. Um, how do you see technology at a national level and how do you see the uh, the university, uh, the University of Alberta and the Faculty of Medicine here, of Medicine and Dentistry here, um, what they're doing um, as part of that. Yeah, so as part of my role, I uh, oversaw and, and helped represent uh, 8,300 students from uh, 15 medical schools across Canada. And before COVID, um, I actually got a chance to visit in person 11 of them. Um, so had a chance to walk through things like anatomy labs or uh, different uh, simulation areas and different medical schools. And I, I think, you know, lots of schools have different technologies. Um, they're readily accessible now, but one thing that the U of A does very, very well is the notion of integrating. So um, I think, you know, one of the fancy things, and this all sounds really cool to everyone, is look, there's all this technology. You can play with all these things and learn all these pieces. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really important that the person using the technology understands why and understands its role in the whole context of what it means to be a physician. Um, and I think there's always that question people ask of, oh, will technology replace uh, physicians or will robots replace and whatnot? Um, and I think how you teach um, and, and how you bring about technology into clinical learning will determine how much physicians continue to um, drive and, and provide the best patient care. Um, and I think uh, the academic technologies team and all the work that Dr. Sonnenberg, Dr. LaPointe, um, Dr. Duff are doing uh, really is leading in that sense um, across Canada when we talk about how to best integrate technology and not just having these really fancy things. Um, nationally, there's these working groups that are starting up on uh, virtual medicine in 
um, curriculum and knowing that again, so many appointments are now being done virtually. How do we ensure that learners uh, are taught and, and skills are developed? And I expect the, the U of A to be leading in that sense as we start to move uh, towards integrating that more into curriculum. Um, and you know, other organizations like Canadian Medical Association um, and others have been putting out you know, these playbooks, these handbooks um, and things, trying to educate physicians on how to do things and, and get people up to speed. And I, again, I see locally a lot of um, staff and others who already uh, are, are what we would consider leaders in the field. Um, so I think the school is very well placed uh, to move forward and teach uh, the next generation of students to be ready. So I'm, I'm cognizant of time. Uh, I do want to have, if there's other questions from the audience, but I did want to ask one more question to the panelists and that's where do you see this going? Where, what's, what's next for us in the future? Maybe Lynn, I'll throw it to you first. I, I think there's been a huge movement and we've seen it throughout Alberta Health Services that it's patient first. And so even though we're getting distracted by other things at times, we continue to come back as to what is best for, for the patient. So, and moving kind of back up that chain to how do we prepare learners for those clinical experiences? How do we look at that environment? How do we look at both learner safety and patient safety? And you're right, they, sometimes people want to see all the bells and whistles, but sometimes you just need to pull out a piece of paper and just draw on it. Simple, just drawings as to what's going on. You don't necessarily need the fancy, you know, three-dimensional anatomy. And then there's other times that, that you do need that moment and you need to sort of have the discernment to know when to use what when. The same piece, you know, just because you have a hammer doesn't mean everything is a nail. And we need to continue to develop the toolbox of um, teaching methods for our instructors, for our clinical preceptors. And we also need to give learners um, those same skills um, in, a, in a staged like approach within their what we call the zone of proximal development. So not making it too easy and not making it too hard, but just getting that learning environment right. Um, where everyone feels supportive and thrives. And I think that's my goal, is to create a, an innovative, creative space for faculty to come and explore and to look at how to do innovation. Um, I still remember the first time, you know, Paul LaPointe ran into my office and was like, Lynn, you've got to see what this, this app can do. Look at this piece of paper. And he literally tapes it to my wall and pulls out his phone and it's like, look, it's literally coming to life in front of me. It's that passion and excitement that if we can ignite in all of our faculty and if our learners are engaged with the material and the learning as they prepare to deliver healthcare, there is no end of possibilities of what we can do here at the University of Alberta and beyond. I'm not sure I can say much more than that. The, uh, Paul, what about you? other than running into Lynn's office and taping things to her wall. Yeah, I'm glad she doesn't mind those kinds of unannounced visits because I, I tend to get excited about these things. Um, I mean, there's a lot of ways I can, I can uh, answer this question. I mean, I, I, see, uh, I see opportunity everywhere for this kind of AR, VR technology, particularly for, for AR. I, you know, I, I've been kind of running a little bit of a, you know, training program in the summers with, with high school students. I mean, these, this is accessible technology and I, and I've been able to teach, you know, students to, to build, you know, AR apps and, and I'm, I love listening to what they come up with is, Oh, you could use this for this. You could use this for that. And I, my, my dream is to start seeing some of those things happen and become mainstream because AR is so accessible. Um, and also, and, you know, as a molecular biologist, I, kind of on that, that uh, idea that information is moving so quickly that, that the chasm between the expert and the layperson is, is, is getting larger all the time. And that's a shame because science is fascinating. And, and I think, I love the idea of you can build a better physician, but you can build a better patient. Like people who have a meaningful understanding of how their body works and what they're made of is is something that I don't think can be, you know, the value of that can't be underestimated. 
And my favorite, maybe the last thing I'll say is when we demoed the Cell 101 VR app that, that uh, and you know, Daniel made us here that I was, was uh, you know, fortunate to be a part of with the Cognitive Projections group with my students, my favorite question in the survey to ask them was, did you show your parents? And most of them did. I never showed my parents something from a textbook. And so it made these students say, this is so cool. I want to show my parents because I think they'll be interested. And, and so I, I would love to see this turn into a tool to really, you know, allow the university to communicate information in a meaningful way to people, be, you know, beyond the, the property. So that's, that's what I'll say about that. All right, Victor, where do you see this going? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the reasons I got involved in medical education and innovation uh, is exactly how Dr. Sonnenberg kind of framed her uh, discussion at the end, which was that if you're transforming the learner, you're transforming care. And I really see the steps being taken um, here at the U of A, working towards transforming the learner to be more agile, um, to be ready to adapt to all the different things that are going to come, because there's no way of preparing us for the exponential logarithmic uh, change in technology that's coming. Um, and what we really need to do is provide people the, the general skill sets uh, to integrate all that, to adopt it properly, uh, and to kind of uh, mold their practices uh, as, as all this stuff comes. Because, you know, if you asked me in 2016 whether I would see these things when I started medical school and be part of a panel with these things, I would have said no. Uh, and that's only four years ago, and I'm considered, you know, part of a technology generation. Um, and so really preparing uh, people for that is, I think, really a, a huge role of medical school. It's just not so much always about, you know, teaching people to know a million facts or ensuring they've memorized everything, um, but really knowing, okay, in this situation, what should I do? What can I ask? Um, who can help me? And what are the tools that are available? Uh, and I think if the U of A um, continues to put out graduates that do that, uh, then we'll be, you know, setting the forefront with regards to uh, physicians providing the best uh, patient care. I think that was wonderfully stated, Victor, the idea that as we transform our learners, we really will transform care. Uh, I think it, this is such an amazing time. I mean, every year there's more and more advances in technology, in educational in event, uh, innovations and techniques. The, uh, some of this is the future, some of this is informed by the past. Dr. Lynn Sonnenberg quoting Vygotsky from 1978 and the zone of proximal development. I think we're, we're building on the shoulders of the people that have come before us and we're using technology to enhance what happens in the U of A, in the Faculty of Medicine and all through the entire campus. So we can enhance the learning experience. We're not trying to replace it, but to enhance it and to really dive down to the things that are the most critical, the most important, and allow our instructors and our, and our learners and our faculty to really get in there and get to the, the important points. So I'm conscious of time, it's 7.59. I was told to stop at eight, so I, I think I deserve a hero cookie. Uh, I wanna turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Brittley Desinia, but before we do that, I just wanna thank our panel for the discussion. Uh, it's been great speaking with you. Uh, and I think, I'm hoping that it was a useful discussion for, for our audience and they, they got some things out of it. And certainly if there's, if there's questions and follow up, um, we're always happy to, to answer questions either now or later on about how things are going. Uh, so maybe right now what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Dr. Lestina to go through her demo. All right, thanks so much uh, to the panelists, that was an excellent overview of where things are at. I'm just gonna get my screen here set up all right. So hopefully that's coming through all right. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm just gonna take you through now a little bit um, of one of the programs that Dr. Sonnenberg was talking about in her presentation. And so this is um, Anatomy TV. And I got connected and learn, started learning about Anatomy TV a little bit when I was looking at how we could be using uh, different technologies to supplement um, what we were learning in the cadaver labs for our anatomy training. And those labs are invaluable experiences, but I know there was always a one more step or one more hope that we could get a better sense or a better appreciation of the relationship of structures 
um, before we got in the lab or as we were going through the lab. So um, in working through one of the anatomy dissectors, um, I started playing around with this. And so this is one of the views that you can have with anatomy TV. Um, you can set up kind of um, pre-prepared -pre models with the st structures that you would like to present um, there. And so as you can see, this is one that allows us to rotate full in all directions and get a really good appreciation for how some of these structures are set up. And so the lab that I was looking at was looking at um, the arterial supply of the brain and really kind of working on some of the foundations of the differences between the posterior and anterior circulation of the brain. And so this model, while we can manipulate it in this way, also lets us be a little bit more interactive. As we hover over, we can see, okay, clicking on this, this is that basilar artery. And now I can appreciate its branches and how it really does contribute to that posterior circulation as it comes up off of the vertebral arteries. And then I can also spin a little bit more and see, okay, here's this, here's the anterior circulation that's coming from, right, coming from our internal carotids. And then there's other features that we can use to get a better appreciation for some of that internal happenings. And so myself, I'm not great at creating these 3D um, models or relationships in my head. So I find this very, very useful to be able to play around like this. So I can select this anterior cerebral artery and now I'm just gonna, I'm going to examine it a little bit and see, okay, now I've selectively gotten rid of some of the branches of the anterior cerebral artery, but um, we can see its course running through the hemisphere here and get a sense of where it really does run there along the corpus callosum. Um, we can stop that view and then we can also go in and um, take away the hemisphere and get a better sense or we can shadow it and then we can get a sense of okay that's where that's where the parenchyma is lying but then these are the these are the pathways of those main artery arteries um, and where they're running. Now one of the other features that we can take advantage of here is um, one of the still slides that Dr. Sonnenberg showed, we're gonna get to that now and look at, we can have uh, the animated version of the dissection and as well as what we might anticipate to see in our own cadaver, acknowledging that there's um, certainly variance um, from what you're going to find in your own cadaver, but um, we can go through and say, okay, oh man, the thyroid really isn't this nice, clear, dark red structure that might be a little bit a little bit more blended into the other tissues that are surrounding it. Um, what is this artery? I can hover and see, but then I can also select it on the cadaver and get an appreciation. Move this model around and again get an appreciation for where it's lying, what its relationship is with the other structures, which is really, really valuable again for someone like myself who really struggles with making these 3D models in their own head and getting a sense of just from reading a page of say Netters, um, what this is expected to look like as I'm going through the dissection. Now, if you want a more simplified version, I can do that as well on here. Um, just get to a more simplified model. Um, it only rotates in so many directions, only has so many structures. Then I can really, again, focus back here on this basilar artery. I get some text explaining what's going on and I can scroll through other, other cuts that the program itself recommends for going through and learning more about the branches and the organization of the arterial supply in the brain. The other way that I found this helpful was I did a number of physical medicine electives, um, including spending some time in the EMG lab. And EMG lab is, nothing but anatomy heavy. Um, and so sometimes I would have anatomy TV up just on the screen. Um, I would take a quick look, look again and say, okay, wait a second, where's that muscle? Okay, I wanna find right here, here's the FDP. I can read about it, um, learn about some of its attachments proximally and distally. I can look at its nerve, get a good little synopsis of its nerve supply, some of its actions, refresh myself, make sure my physical exam, what I'm expecting to see on EMG would match. And then also I got just nice quick access to some of the surface anatomy that I might be looking for. I can review quickly through my dermatomes or my cutaneous distribution as well. And that's all just easily accessible right here. And just nice to have, again, um, some of our panelists were talking about just having an 
uh, information at our fingertips. And again, this is a nice 3D way to have this information at my fingertips when I'm in, in the EMG clinic. And then one of the last really cool features that's starting to be built is starting to pair these animated models with uh, real imaging. Um, and so whether it's CT, MRI, or even ultrasound, um, going through and being able to start working on building skills in reading or interpreting what we're seeing on imaging. And so then from here again, I can hover over top and see, okay, this is the cerebellum. But I was more interested in, again, some of the arterial supply. And so I have a hard time kind of picking out what might be the arteries in here, but that's okay. I can come to this model and it's, again, it's nicely colored and bright red. And I'm gonna say, okay, here is the anterior cerebral artery. All right, that seems to be in a similar place here. I'm gonna click. So then this is the internal carotid. And again, it's highlighting it for me. And then what's super cool is that structure stays highlighted and I can follow it. And I can follow that progression through the brain and I can see it highlighted. Um, it's fairly fine, but I can see it highlighted on this image as well. And I can follow it as I go through that model, which is super cool and super helpful um, in trying to put the anatomy lab learning on top of some of the clinical understanding that we might need. So that's a quick little run through of anatomy TV um, and some of the examples of the way I've used it in clinic um, and as a med student as well. That's amazing, Brittany. I know one of the questions I answered in the chat is, is this available to all University of Alberta students? And the answer is, of course, yes. So anyone with a CCID, whether an instructor, a student of any sort, has full access to all of this capability. So there's also a version online. If you want to check it out yourselves, um, you can go to anatomy.tv and you can do a few of the, the samples and examples in a, a little trial on yourself. And maybe it'll make you want to come back and be a student at the U of A. I'll turn things over to Dr. Paula Point. We saw one of your videos, your AR sort of apps, but it's a lot to take in if this is new technology for you. So I know you prepared a few, few examples and how amazing it is that you are literally going to bring a piece of paper to life with a free app that's available on your phone. Walk us through that, Paul. Yes, I will. So what I'm gonna show you, just for people who maybe aren't familiar with, with augmented reality, you have a, 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 a virtual digital object that you can attach to a target image. And that target image can be a piece of paper. So I printed off kind of what a typical lecture, lecture slide might look like. I've got four of these. This can be projected on a big um, you know, screen at the front of a lecture theater. It can be on a flash card. And so when that image is detected by the app on your phone or your tablet, it will, it will introduce, it will attach, it will bring up this digital 3D object. So um, so I'm going to show you four different little applets I made um, and they kind of each represent different types of things you might want to accomplish. And so I'll start with the one that Lynn kind of had the screenshot of and I, I kind of want everyone to keep in mind how difficult it is to, in any kind of a 2D picture, to see that that's a helix. You can see that it's kind of got some swiggles on it, but a helical structure is one of the hardest things to portray in two dimensions because there's you just don't have the the uh, opportunity to show the depth so in order to show this i'm going to have to run this little applet on my emulator and i'm going to turn my 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 screen off or my camera off in zoom but you should still be able to hear me and i'm going to share the the um do a screen share here of my my screen two. There we go. So I will start with hopefully everybody can see this. And I will bring up the DNA helix one. So when I when I run this, the camera is going to detect the image on the paper. There it is. And you can see there's a digital image, a digital object projected above it and you can see there's the helix forming you can you know get very close to it and see the, the hydrogen bonds are going to appear in a second there they are the yellow dashes and every one of those spheres represented an atom right so that can be a little busy to see so you can fade out uh, that particular representation and show the 
the, the helix as a, more of a cartoon representation showing each of the bases. And there's, of course, what, what Lynn showed in the model. And it's really attached to the paper. So it doesn't matter where you move it, it's gonna be in the same place. So there's the first one. Um, the second one represents a little bit of a kind of a typical thing for molecular biology students learning about transfer RNAs. And the problem here is that almost every textbook that ever has ever been printed shows kind of a schematic of what a transfer RNA looks like. And it doesn't really represent what this object looks like in real life. And, and you need to see it in, in terms of that actual three-dimensional structure in order to understand how it does what it does in a cell. So I will run this one. And let's see if this one was giving me trouble before here. Oh, let me try that again. I did something to zoom here. There we go. So there is the linear uh, tRNA molecule. And then right above it is what you would typically see in a textbook. And those are all the sort of features of a tRNA that you would point out. And so here's my actual, you know, finger in real life saying there's the T loop, there's the anticodon here at the bottom. So if multiple students were standing around the same piece of paper and using the app to look at it, they would see the same object in the same place. They could point at it and the other person could see what they're seeing. And so as this plays here, you're going to see that linear polymer of nucleic acids that is color coded to what's in the schematic. It will, well, it's coming here any minute now. It'll morph into what a tRNA actually looks like. And it shows where the features in the schematic actually are located in the, in the actual three-dimensional structures. You can see the, you know, the anticodon at the bottom where the bases are turned out available to you know, translate the information contained in the messenger RNA. So for those people who are molecular biology buffs. So I will uh, stop that one. Um, and then there's one here that, uh, is of a nucleosome. So one of the things you might want to teach in your class is about how there's three meters of DNA in every cell. And it has to fit in a very tight, compact structure in, um, in the nucleus, which is only a, a few microns across of, of, that, of that same cell. And it does so by wrapping like a, like a thread around a spool around something called a nucleosome. So hopefully this one is going to call up the way I wanted it. Let me try that one again. Oh, Zoom doesn't want to let me share that one. You know what? I might... Uh, I might move on to the fourth one here because that one, Zoom doesn't want to let me share. It. I might come back to that one. Um, so the last one here I'll show you is one of, that kind of is a little bit like what Brittany showed with anatomical data. So this is a, a model. Let me uh, share my screen again. Hopefully everybody can see this and I will run this one. So this is a, a static model, which is a three dimensional, a very detailed 3D model that we were able to obtain through a collaboration that we brokered with the University of Amsterdam um, of a Carnegie stage 13 human embryo. And so you can see it there. It's, it's right there in my above the paper. So if I move the paper around, it's attached to it. So you can, as an instructor, assign that on a flashcard. You can have that floating in front of your classroom, in front of a big lecture, you know, in, in a large lecture theater, and every student would see this digital object. And what's kind of cool about this, Brittany was talking about internal structures and how you can trace certain structures through many, many cross sections. So what I'm gonna show you is how this can act as a little bit like a virtual ultrasound. So the closer I get, 
it will actually start to reveal the internal structures of the object. So it's almost like it's very interactive. The students can take this object and look at any structure they want to. So this is all of the structures are, are color coded. Now, obviously, I'm a molecular biologist, so Lynn would know more about what is inside this guy. But more than one student could all be standing around this and looking at the exact same object. They could point at the one they see, and the other person would see it in the same place. So I think this one has a lot of potential for certainly educational purposes, um, but even for clinical applications. When you know a, a physician is trying to explain something to a patient, and then they get out a piece of paper and a pencil, and it's really hard for them to kind of say, this is where this structure is and this is what's wrong with it. This allows you to kind of do that in a, in a virtual way, very, very accessible. So this one's one of my favorites. I like this one. So one of the questions right. is these AR apps, Paul, are really cool, but how hard are they to make? Now you're demonstrating this to us in your actual creative mode here and students would just be really seeing this app through a phone. So really just seeing the image and the diagram in front of them. But in order to, for us to be able to deliver this during this virtual format, you've had to give us your creator view. So give us a little bit of an inside, insider's view of how hard is this? Can anyone, can, can I decide tomorrow that I want to do this? Uh, yes. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I've worked a lot with high school students learning how to make these, these augmented reality objects. And you need a source of, of, of 3D data. Um, and for me, that would be the protein data bank, the cryo-electron microscopy data bank. Uh, you can be a digital artist. You can have anatomical data. The apps themselves are actually quite easy to make. Um, it's nice to work with, you know, experts, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. But... Uh, they're, they're remarkably easy to make. And um, the way you would distribute them, the apps that I've deployed on a kind of a prototype basis in my class is I'm running this emulator on my computer, but I can export it as an app that can be uh, installed on an Android phone. And then whoever I email that link to, they can install it like any other app. And as soon as they launch it, it looks just like their camera app on their, if you really want to take a picture on your, on your phone or on your tablet, you just don't press the capture button. It just, anytime it sees that target object, that digital object will be there and you'll be the only one who can see, you'll be able to see it through your phone. So they're, they're actually remarkably easy to make. And um, you know, even a molecular biologist can, can learn how to make them. And they're very easy to distribute. You can email the installation links, at least for Android. There's some maybe technical detail, details with Apple. They're a little harder to distribute. You have to publish them through their app store, but this is all certainly not that difficult. So what got you interested in, in virtual reality? This, how, how costly is this? Have you partnered with anyone? Um, is all the money going out? Is there ever any money coming in? These are some of those, those reality questions. Right. Yeah, I mean, my interest in this was a little bit, uh, you know, serendipitous. I, I didn't know I should be interested in it until I had the opportunity to see it. And so I was, I was introduced to uh, Cognitive Projections, who was already kind of active in this space at U of A. And then I kind of acted as a content lead to generate the, the molecular models um, that are useful to my students. And the reason I wanted to do it, because it's just so difficult to explain the mechanics and context and scale of how molecular machines work, um, you know, really at, a, at any level without really engaging high content models that have moving parts. Proteins are machines. They have moving parts. And so to me, it seemed like a, a, a absolute necessity to take advantage of this technology. And then I, uh, I've kind of shifted my focus into things that are a little more accessible, which is AR. VR, of course, you need a viewer and it kind of disconnects you from the group you're in because you've got something on your face. AR, it can be used anywhere in a, in a common space and just on a, on a smartphone. So need an opportunity. It's fantastic. And I, I think branching out and having the University of Alberta actually being a leader in cell biology, molecular biology, in terms of augmented reality, is something that we can be really proud of here at the university. And so, and it, 
I think it's going to be, you know, if we were to do this presentation, even from five years from now, I think we're going to see a lot of these augmented realities as an actual reality and broadly available the same way we had those those molecular model kits trying to piece things together. I, I think this is sort of where we're going and how we interact um, in these digital spaces will be fascinating to see. So hopefully I'll be like, um, you know, Barry and, and around in, in, you know, 44 years from now to see how medical education is going to be different. I'll have my tricorder, of course, I'm sure, and uh, be able to transport myself through time. So I don't, I think we've answered the majority of questions. We've seen anatomy TV in action um, and how we're comparing, you know, making those harder to, to recognize 3D concepts a lot easier for students, particularly in, with imaging um, and with dissection. We've seen how going right down to the basics um, within cell biology and seeing some of those um, augmented reality apps um, in their application um, and in reality for us. Um, is fascinating where we've come. And so without further ado, I will pass things back to our host of the evening, um, Elise, for a final few wrap-up words. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, thank you for demonstrating those tools. So cool um, and makes it just so accessible. Um, you can see that through the Q&A, everybody asking, how do I get in on this? Um, and I just want to say that Dr. Sonnenberg made that suggestion to add that final component and uh, alongside Dr. Lapointe and Dr. Lucina, they put so much extra work into bringing that together. So I just really want to thank them. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Duff for moderating such an interesting and dynamic panel discussion. I really appreciate all your insights as well as those of all the panelists. And I'd like to... Uh, Wish Dr. Du a special thank you. He's joining us from Toronto uh, to share his thoughts. And we're so proud of our alumni community. Um, and it means so much to us when alumni are willing to give their time back to the faculty. It was such a pleasure to put this event together with speakers who are so passionate about what they do. And to all of our attendees, thank you for dedicating an hour and a half of your time to hear about the impact of our academic technologies office. I hope this webinar leaves you feeling inspired about the work we're doing here at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry and makes you hopeful about health possibilities for the future. There are a number of other virtual events happening for Alumni Week and I encourage you to check those out on the Alumni Association website. If you missed a live presentation, recording should be available in most cases. Thank you for joining us and we hope to connect with you again soon. <laughs>